secret gospels, lost sayings of Jesus Christ, scriptures hidden away from the average person only to be revealed to those who were initiated, those who seek true knowledge. These are the Gnostic scriptures. But is there really a Gnostic Bible? And do these writings actually contain new and groundbreaking information about the life and teachings of Jesus Christ? In 1945, a collection of ancient books was discovered just outside the small town of Nag Hammadi, Egypt. Little did we know at the time that this discovery was about to change almost everything we knew about early Christianity. These ancient sacred texts that were buried in the Egyptian mountainside had just been unearthed for the first time in over 1,600 years. This collection of ancient codices is known to us today as the Gnostic Scriptures. But what exactly are the Gnostic Scriptures, and what do they teach us about the earliest followers of Christ? And do they really give us new and accurate information about the historical Jesus of Nazareth? Let's first start with the legend of how these texts were discovered. In 1945, a man named Muhammad Ali al-Saman went outside the small town of Nag Hammadi, located in Upper Egypt on the west side of the Nile River, searching for sabak, which is a manure-like fertilizer. Muhammad began digging in the soil of the mountainous region, which was littered with ancient caves used as grave sites. While digging, Muhammad struck something with his fingers, and it turned out to be an ancient red earthenware jar. Muhammad thought he had just found buried treasure. In his excitement, he ripped off the lid of the jar, and at first, he thought he saw flecks of gold. But much to his disappointment, it turned out only to be aged papyrus fragments that turned golden brown over the centuries. Muhammad, of course, had no way of knowing what exactly he just found, but he did know they were old books of some sort, which he found rather useless. Legend has it that he took the books home and gave them to his mother, who then tossed some of the aged and crumbling pages into the oven for kindling. Then the story gets a little weird. It is said that Muhammad and his brothers wanted to avenge the murder of his father. So they ambushed their father's murderer, hacked off his limbs, ripped out his heart, and ate it right there on the spot. Fearing police investigation, Muhammad handed over the newly discovered texts to a priest. A local teacher saw these codices and had one sent to Cairo to be appraised. Once they reached Cairo, the books ended up in the hands of individual antiquities dealers. The first book of the Gnostic scriptures, known as Codex I, was offered up for sale in New York and Paris. And finally, in 1951, the Jung Foundation of Zurich purchased the Codex. The Jung Codex, as it was now called, was eventually repatriated to Egypt in 1956. All of the Nag Hammadi scriptures that Muhammad found are now in the Coptic Museum in Cairo, Egypt, where they still remain to this very day. How much of this legendary discovery story is actually true is up for debate. But however these texts ended up seeing the light of day, one thing is undeniably true. Even though Muhammad didn't find gold that day, the discovery he did make was one of the most important discoveries of all time. Scholars quickly began working out the details of these newly discovered documents, but it would be a while yet before the general public could get their hands on these writings. Translating these texts took a great deal of time, primarily because all of these writings were written in an ancient Egyptian language called Coptic. Coptic is a modified Egyptian version of the Greek language. Scholars believe that the Nag Hammadi texts found by Muhammad were not the originals but they were copies, and perhaps even copies of copies, of the original documents. Linguistic scholars that specialize in Greek and Coptic languages believe the original manuscripts were written in Greek and later translated into Coptic, presumably for a community of Christian Egyptian monks living in or around the town of Nag Hammadi. The daunting task of translating these delicate ancient papyri manuscripts was made even more difficult because these texts were not in pristine condition. 1,600 years buried in the desert tends to degrade the quality of paper-like material. Fortunately, all 12 of these books, called codices, were bound in leather, and they were stiffened to create hardcovers. This stiffening process takes the inside of the soft leather cover and slaps a paper mache-like material on it called cartonage. This makes the book much more durable by essentially gluing leftover pieces of papyri writings together inside the leather cover. Without the leather and cartonage hardcovers, these texts would have been in much worse shape than they were. Even though they were in pretty good shape for being 1,600 years old, they still were fragmentary and had lacunas or holes in the manuscripts, where figuring out what was written is virtually impossible. One of the first and most exciting and interesting things scholars wanted to figure out is how old were these texts. Dating the texts were extremely important, 
How old were they? Because the older they were and the closer they were to the time of Christ, the more likely these texts were reliable sources for the life and teachings of Jesus. But dating these texts were almost just as difficult as translating them. Dating ancient texts is tricky because there are two primary focuses. The first thing scholars need to do is figure out if they have the original manuscripts or if they have copies, or copies of copies of copies of the original manuscripts. Since scholars believe that the Nag Hammadi scriptures were not the originals, they had to figure out when the copies were written and when the originals might have been written. Not an easy task. The other reason dating these texts is so difficult is because it's not one continuous book. Just like in the Bible, you have 66 books that were translated by different people throughout different times, the Nag Hammadi scriptures, or the Gnostic scriptures, are no different. The Nag Hammadi scriptures contained 52 writings in total, with a few duplicates. Out of the 52 writings, scholars only knew of six of these writings before their discovery in Nag Hammadi in 1945. Dating these texts took the work of linguistic scholars, Bible scholars, historians, papyrologists, archaeologists, and they were all studying the texts and the matrix from which these texts came from. One of the best ways to date ancient manuscripts is to take a look at the cartonage or the stiffening material in the covers. In the case of the Nag Hammadi texts, the cartonage fragments produces three dates, 341 CE, 346 CE, and 348 CE. Whichever date is the correct one, it seems most likely that the Nag Hammadi scriptures were copied in the middle of the 4th century in an urban environment preserved by Christian monks copying out the texts in a nearby monastic settlement. But that's when the copies were written. When were the original manuscripts written? As the various experts worked tirelessly, it became increasingly clear that many of these texts date between the 2nd to 4th century CE. But some of these Gnostic texts might actually predate the Gospels found in the Bible itself. The Gospel of Thomas, for example, is given a date between 60 to 140 CE. If the date of 60 CE is correct, this predates the earliest canonical Gospel, which is Mark, by almost a decade. This find is revolutionary. Could Jesus have actually said the things documented in the Gospel of Thomas? Maybe. Despite what the title of this video suggests, these Nag Hammadi codices are best described as a library of ancient texts. Calling these the Gnostic Bible is not really a great term because that implies that Gnostics agreed upon these texts as inspired and authoritative. And as far as we know, that's just not the case. The library of texts found at Nag Hammadi would have been inspired scripture for some sects of Gnosticism and not others. For example, some of the writings are clearly Valentinian and represent a Valentinian flavor of Gnosticism. Other texts represent more of a Sethian flavor of Gnosticism. It's unlikely, however, that Valentinian and Sethian Gnostics described themselves in this way. They are not denominations of Gnostics, like Baptists and Presbyterians are denominations of Protestant Christianity. As far as we know, that's not how it worked. But it is clear that there were ancient Gnostic Christians with differing theologies, cosmologies, and religious practices. So what kind of Christians were the Gnostics, and what do their texts reveal about their type of Christianity? Well, it does seem that these Gnostics thought of themselves as Christians, and particularly the Valentinian Gnostics probably worshipped with other proto-Orthodox Christians. In other words, they worshipped with regular old Christians. A 2nd century Christian author by the name of Irenaeus of Lyons wrote a five-volume work titled Against Heresies. He clearly thought the Gnostics were heretics, but said that Valentinian Gnostics so closely resembled Orthodox Christians that he described Valentinians as wolves in sheep's clothing. So it seems clear that Valentinian Gnostics were seen with and around other Orthodox Christians. It also seems clear that Gnostic Christianity didn't evolve out of a Jewish matrix, but a pagan one. Gnostics seemed to have a good grasp of the Old and New Testament, but also combined their beliefs with Greek philosophy, like that of Plato and Aristotle. Many of the Gnostic scriptures show signs of Middle Platonic philosophy. Gnostics also seemed to combine their form of Christianity with Egyptian cosmology and theogony and ancient Roman magical practices. So the type of Christianity you find within the Gnostic scriptures sometimes feels very normal, like things you've read out of the Bible before but other times it feels completely different. But what about the Gnostic scriptures themselves? What kind of literature is found within the Gnostic scriptures? It's important to remember that the people who wrote these scriptures had Gnosis, and they were writing it for other people who had Gnosis. 
The type of gnosis described here comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. But this wasn't just any old kind of knowledge. It was divinely revealed knowledge that led to salvation. And it took the human spark and reunited it with the all in the pleroma. Because of this, many of the Gnostic scriptures are not that user-friendly. They thought the people reading this also had gnosis and knew the basics of Gnostic theology. One of the easiest ways to know if you're reading a Gnostic text is to look out for Gnostic buzzwords. Words like aeons, archons, pleroma, demiurge, sophia, barbello, bridal chamber, enoia, epinoia, gnosis, yaldaboeth, yaltaboeth, invisible spirit, pronoia, nous, pneuma, pronoia, first principles, life, and the great spirit. These terms are often, but not always, associated with Gnostic scriptures. The Gnostic scriptures themselves contain gospels like the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Truth, the Gospel of Philip, and the Gospel of the Egyptians. There are other Gnostic gospels that were not found in the Nag Hammadi library, such as the Gospel of Mary and the Gospel of Judas. These gospels present good news, but differ greatly from the type of literature found in the New Testament. Also among the Gnostic scriptures are the secret books, sometimes called apocryphons, which comes from the Greek word apocryphos, which means hidden away or secretive. There is the secret book of John, also called the apocryphon of John, and the secret book of James. Each of these books claim to have secret information from Jesus Christ. Gnostic scriptures also contain prayers, like the prayer of the Apostle Paul and the prayer of thanksgiving. And the last category of literature found in the Gnostic scriptures is what I like to call the weird books. Not the most technical definition, but they are weird. Books like the first and second apocalypse of James, The Thunder, Perfect Mind, The Discourse on the Eighth and Ninth, Zostrianos, Trimorphic Protonoia, and The Thought of Noria, just to name a few. The discovery of these texts in 1945 completely changed our view of early Christianity. It is no longer acceptable to talk about the early church as having a unified theology, or to even talk about the early church as a monolithic entity. The early church was diverse with a wide range of beliefs. As Christianity left the Near East and began mixing with people in other nations, those people brought their own culture and intellect to Christianity, which caused Christianity to not be just one thing, but many. The early church didn't have Christianity, it had Christianities. And Gnosticism was but one iteration of Christianity in the second century. These texts give us insight into the life, teachings, and the earliest followers of Jesus Christ. It's difficult to know if any of the sayings in the Gnostic scriptures really go back to the historical Jesus. Many times when Jesus is quoted in the Nag Hammadi scriptures, there are things we've all heard before, but other times the sayings come completely out of left field. In the Gospel of Thomas, for example, Jesus says in saying number nine, now the sower went out, took a handful of seeds, and scattered them. Some fell on the road, the birds came and gathered them up. Others fell on rock, and did not take root in the soil, and did not produce ears. And others fell on thorns, they choked the seeds, and worms ate them. And others fell on good soil, and it produced good fruit. It bore sixty per measure, and a hundred and twenty per measure. This is Jesus' parable of the sower. Nothing too weird here. Now let's look at the next two sayings in the Gospel of Thomas, which are sayings number 10 and 11. Jesus said, I have cast fire upon the world, and see, I am guarding it until it blazes. Jesus said, This heaven will pass away, and the one above it will pass away. The dead are not alive, and the living will not die. In the days when you consumed what is dead, you made it what is alive. When you come to dwell in the light, what will you do? On the day when you were one, you became two. And when you become two, what will you do? Hmm, this seems quite a bit different from what we hear Jesus say in the canonical New Testament Gospels. But did Jesus say these things? And if so, how do we know and what do they mean? It's weird because the Gospel of Thomas has some sayings that we know from the canonical Gospels and other sayings that are so totally different and just kind of bizarre and out there. Ultimately, it's impossible to know for sure if Jesus said any of this, but it's wildly fascinating and fun to think about. We do know from the beginning of Luke's gospel, when Luke writes to Theophilus, that there were many writings about Jesus circulating around at that time. Luke writes in Luke 1.1, 1, 1, 
Many have undertaken to write an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, so that you may know with certainty of the things you have been taught, my dear Theophilus." Luke here is clearly stating that many things have been written and said about Jesus Christ. So it's not impossible to think that some things just weren't documented in the canonical New Testament Gospels and others were documented elsewhere. So do these Gnostic scriptures actually contain these secret hidden teachings of Jesus? It's possible. Now to wrap this video up, I'd just like to say that there are a lot of people who are interested in Gnosticism and they run out to their local bookstore or to Amazon to try and find the Gnostic scriptures uh, translated into English. And they come home, they get their book, they're so excited, they rip it open and they realize just how difficult and confusing these texts are. And they usually give up before reading very much of it. Uh, I would like to say that there are three wonderful translations of these Gnostic scriptures in English, which I'll have listed and linked down in the description. Um, but a little bit of expertise and uh, prep work is in order in order to really understand what is going on because it can be very, very confusing. So I also will have down in the description some links to some textbooks that are really, really wonderful. They're kind of introductory textbooks that will get you off in the right direction. Personally, I have a degree in religious studies, classics, and ancient history from the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, and I took an entire class on Gnosticism, and I got to work with one of the greatest Gnosticism scholars in the entire world. I worked with Dr. John D. Turner, who was not only a, one of the best professors I've ever had, but also a really good friend. And so I wanna dedicate this video to him because without him, it would be incredibly difficult for me to understand these Gnostic scriptures. If you are interested in learning more about Gnosticism or just religion and history in general, consider subscribing to this channel for more. And as always, stay thirsty for knowledge.